Super Mario is perhaps one of the most iconic characters in gaming history. This popular gaming character has had a long history, but the game that truly made it popular is Super Mario World. Hello and welcome to our channel. Today we're going to talk about the history of Super Mario World. So, let us begin. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System games Super Mario World and Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island are among the eight Mario adventures that might easily be considered among the best video games ever created. Super Mario World changed the traditional Mario formula into something bigger, faster, brighter, and some would even argue better. It contributed to the definition of the 16-bit era. Yoshi's Island, the sequel, is a stunning picture of pastel hues, grand landscapes, and lovely sprites that capture the creative and imaginative mashup that only Nintendo could bring to life. Hiroshi Yamauchi, then president of Nintendo, delivered a startling announcement in the summer of 1988. That was it. The final days of the Famicom were here. In July of 1983, Nintendo debuted the Famicom, a home video game device aimed at families. By 1988, Nintendo had cornered 90% of the Japanese video game market thanks to the sale of 12 million consoles and many games. Even so, Yamauchi had cause for alarm. The Famicom's popularity and subsequent sales peaked in 1986 and had since been on the decline. Yamauchi, in an interview with the Japanese magazine Touch, lamented the Famicom's declining sales and acknowledged the arrival of the next generation of gaming consoles. A new player entered the video game market, increasing the level of competition. A major player in the electronics industry, NEC, entered the video game console market with the PC Engine in October 1987. NEC claimed that its system was the most advanced of its kind and announced plans to sell a CD-ROM accessory in the near future. Teenagers and young adults were the target audience for the PC Engine. More than 500,000 consoles were shipped by NEC in just two months. Even Nintendo was monitoring Sega's process. In October of 1988, Sega intended to release the Mega Drive, a video game console. Aside from playing video games, Sega said their new system could do a lot more. You could use it as a modem, print documents, and more. Furthermore, the Mega Drive was the pioneering 16-bit gaming console. Sega has elatedly branded its product as 16-bit. Nintendo's 8-bit Famicom now seemed weak and obsolete, but Yamauchi had a secret weapon up his sleeve. His comments in an interview with Touch Magazine revealed that Nintendo would be refocusing on its next-generation platform, the 16-bit Super Famicom. In 1987, a month before NEC debuted the PC Engine, Yamauchi began teasing the system. In 1988, Yamauchi felt it was time to spill the beans. It came out a month before the Mega Drive was released by Sega, and that timing was no accident. This wasn't just an update, it was a cautionary tale for prospective purchasers. Do not throw away your cash. The newest Nintendo gaming system can be bought very soon. When compared to its predecessor, the Super Famicom represented a technological leap forward. Super Mario Bros. 4 was named as one of the titles Yamauchi said Nintendo was prototyping right now. The news came as a shock, especially since Nintendo had not yet launched Super Mario Bros. 3. This last summer, Shigeru Miyamoto, the man responsible for creating Mario, and his staff at Nintendo's Entertainment Analysis and Development Branch were working feverishly to complete Super Mario Bros. 3. The game was scheduled for an October 1988 release by Nintendo. Miyamoto deemed Super Mario Bros. 3 the definitive Mario game on the Famicom and the authentic sequel to the original Super Mario Bros. The game's size was increased by a factor of 10, with 90 levels spread across 8 gigantic planets and a wide variety of new power-ups. 
Also, Super Mario Bros. 3 use of the Famicom's multi-memory controller chip on the cartridge was a huge technical challenge. By the end of development, Miyamoto's team was exhausted. He thought they had put everything they had into it, but there was no time to relax. The new instruction from Nintendo's upper echelons was to finish Super Mario Bros. 4 for the Super Famicom in time for its release. As such, Nintendo had no choice but to create Super Mario Bros. as a launch offer. Without a doubt, Super Mario Bros. were the most played series on the Famicom and its foreign counterpart, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Developing a new Super Mario game for Nintendo's 16-bit machine was a certain way to sell consoles, but the team needed extra time and manpower to understand the new technology in time. So, they grew in size, adding new programmers, testers, and artists. Additionally, they recalled military personnel. Nine of the over 16 crew members working on Super Mario Bros. 4 previously worked on Super Mario Bros. 3. One of them was a guy named Toshihiko Nakago. Nakago worked as a programmer for Systems Research and Development SRD, an independent development company with an office within Nintendo's Kyoto headquarters. For Super Mario Bros. 4, Nakago was in charge of programming. Koji Kondo, who had been composing music for the series from the beginning, came back to do so. Once again, Hideki Kono and Katsuya Eguchi were in charge of the maps and set design, respectively. Then there was Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto's prominence at Nintendo grew substantially in 1988 with the release of the Super Famicom and the subsequent expansion of his responsibilities as the company's top software designer and developer. Miyamoto had to work on three new games in addition to consulting on the Super Famicom's console and controller design. As a result, Miyamoto had to take a back seat as Super Mario Bros. 4's producer. He recalled that, I mainly just sat back and watched, chimed in with my own thoughts whenever I thought it would be helpful. When it came time to make Super Mario Bros. 4, Takashi Tezuka, an unsung hero of the series, was put in charge. In 1984, Tezuka began his career at Nintendo as a designer for the company, creating manuals and playing cards. But there were times when artists worked together with game developers. The two were eventually partnered together, with Tezuka working alongside Shigeru Miyamoto. They became an effective team when working together. They collaborated in the creation of the original Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, and many other games. Super Mario Bros. development time may have been too much for three. Tezuka, in addition to serving as director, also designed the game's characters and aesthetic elements. Later, Tezuka stated that the plot didn't come together very well. The release of Super Mario Bros. 3 was pushed back by Nintendo by a total of six months because of this. In the future, Tezuka would not repeat his previous error. Taking on too much, he remarked, was not something he recommended. Tezuka directed Super Mario Bros. 4, focusing on team management and contributing to the game's general design. Since Shigefumi Hino was a novice to Nintendo, he was given responsibility for the game's aesthetics. He had only been with the firm for a year and a half at that point, and the only other game he had worked on was a sequel to Famicom Grand Prix F1 race that was never released. Shigefumi Hino was now in charge of what is perhaps Nintendo's most crucial undertaking. He was under intense scrutiny after praising the production values of Super Mario Bros. 3. According to him, knowing that it will be held up to that standard was scary. Due to this, I was concerned about how we could introduce Super Mario to a new audience. But the Super Mario Bros. 4 development team had a far more potent console to deal with, the Super Famicom. As a result, they were eager to test out all the new features. It was a relief for Toshihiko Nakago, the head programmer, that his team no longer had to worry so much about hardware limits, and Miyamoto believed that the new, expansive color palette would make it simpler to produce pictures. 
The team also received new and improved programming resources. Until then, programmers had to draw out Mario levels by hand on graph paper before transferring them to the computer. The designers can now make changes to the levels in-engine with the help of dedicated software. There would be a learning curve associated with using new technology and software. The development crew for Mario 4 decided to try something new. By this time, Nintendo's formula for Super Mario Bros. games was complete. Athleticism, speed, vertical leaps, dodging and stomping adversaries were important themes in Mario games. They have to do with being welcoming to newcomers. A Mario game is something a total novice could pick up, figure out, and enjoy. Finally, the theme of independence permeated Super Mario Bros. It was possible for players to complete a level without gaining any coins. However, players were also given the option to take their time, make use of the available power-ups, and explore each level at their own pace. Super Mario Bros. could be played in a variety of ways. Tezuka and Miyamoto agreed that the formula made the Mario game so beloved throughout the years and should not be altered for the upcoming installment. Instead, Nintendo could refine the ideas, incorporate entertaining new features, and showcase cutting-edge hardware with the Super Famicom. It would be the pinnacle of Super Mario games so far. While this was going on, on November 21, 1988, a prototype of the Super Famicom was unveiled by Nintendo at their Kyoto headquarters. More than 200 media outlets sent representatives to the unveiling, including television, magazine, and newspaper reporters. The Super Famicom, which Nintendo promised to release in July of 1989, was an extraordinarily aggressive goal. The absence of Super Mario Bros. 4 was glaring among Nintendo's early game demonstrations. The team was still working on polishing the game's mechanics. They were always adapting as they went. The game's obvious debt to Super Mario Bros. 3 was clear right away. A lot of the visual elements, such as Mario's sprite, were recycled. Many adversaries resembled their Super Mario Bros. 3 incarnations, while the Koopaling bosses still resided in the castles. Some of the power-ups had returned, such as the raccoon suit for flight, and the global maps seemed quite similar, albeit considerably larger. It could have been mistaken for something else because of the resemblance. Many of my co-workers have remarked how similar it is to Famicom games. Hazuka considered the feedback and made adjustments accordingly. The sprites were improved by Shigefumi Hino, after dabbling in a more three-dimensional style, the team continued to explore new avenues. Even the global map, under the direction of Hideki Kono, has undergone significant changes, moving away from the Mario 3 aesthetic. The development team behind Super Mario Bros. 4 had to do more than just improve the game's visuals. They also had to find ways to highlight the Super Famicom's enhanced functionality. The 16-bit console had a wide variety of cool features, such as the ability to scale, rotate, and even use transparent backgrounds. To showcase the new hardware, Nintendo wanted Super Mario Bros. 4, but Miyamoto was reticent to add features only for the sake of novelty. He explained that the team didn't want to integrate a new feature just because they found something fantastic that the hardware could do, something that made them say, whoa if doing so would have disrupted the game's balance or flow. The developers incorporated new features with care, and the Super and Super Famicom was emphasized with big sprites. It was easy to become lost in the game thanks to the waters and adversaries' translucence. Backgrounds that scrolled added a new dimension to the levels. The revolving levels added a new dimension of difficulty to the boss battles Mario faced. The developers of Super Mario Bros. 4 made some significant improvements to the game's mechanics, in addition to the aforementioned technological advancements. Thankfully, they had a lot of information from players to work with. After two and a half years in production, Super Mario Bros. 3 was released in Japan on October 23, 1988. 
Super Mario Bros. 3 was the best-selling Famicom game for months and was met with universal acclaim. But it wasn't exactly beginner-friendly. With Super Mario Bros. 4, Miyamoto aimed to strike a better balance. The game has to be accessible to players of varying ability levels because it was a launch product. As a result, they added several elements to make the game simpler to pick up and play. If Mario was too little for a certain level, checkpoints were added to increase his size. In order to further differentiate themselves from the previous games, the creators of Super Mario Bros. 4 gave it a new name in the summer of 1989. Super Mario World seemed like the perfect moniker for Mario's brand new adventure, but things changed when, unsurprisingly, Nintendo opted to delay the debut of the Super Famicom. There was a wide variety of causes. While the Super Famicom hardware was essentially complete, there was a severe paucity of downloadable content. Even though 21 businesses had signed on to become third-party developers for this system, Nintendo was still working on launch titles, and none of them had development kits. Due to the introduction of a new generation of semiconductor and chip technology, manufacturers had to divide their manufacturing capacity, leading to a worldwide chip shortage and resulting in significantly higher pricing. Yamauchi wanted the Super Famicom to cost no more than 20,000 yen or $150. However, the Super Famicom's price may increase beyond 30,000 yen, around $225, because of the scarcity of chips. Since there was a lack of chips, Nintendo produced at full steam. Back then, Nintendo was churning out 3 million Famicoms and NES units every single month. They were also grappling with stock problems of their new handheld system, the Game Boy. Later that year, Nintendo intended to release the Game Boy in North America. The supply shortages led one columnist to comment, why create a rival product when you cannot cope with what you already have. The 8-bit Famicom was not completely dead. Both Super Mario Bros. 3 and the impending Dragon Quest IV from Enix were smash hits. Due to the game's anticipated high demand, Enix scheduled its release for the weekend. It appeared that Yamauchi's early tease of the Super Famicom was successful. Many respondents to a poll in Famitsu magazine indicated they weren't interested in buying a PC Engine until the Super Famicom was released. The PC Engine, developed by NEC, was selling well, but it couldn't compete with the Famicom, which had already made its way into one-third of Japanese homes at that point. And Sega's 16-bit Mega Drive was largely ignored. Up to that point, they had only moved 400,000 units. There was no reason to expedite the release of the Super Famicom, since that competition is less of a concern. Nintendo held a press conference on July 28, 1989 at their Kyoto headquarters to reveal the Super Famicom will be delayed for a full year. While news of the holdup was prominent, more information was also available the new Super Famicom from Nintendo was revealed. Finally, they showed off a demo of Super Mario World, one of the most anticipated games of all time. Surprisingly though, opinions were divided. Many media outlets were amazed by the game's technological improvements, but were left feeling underwhelmed by the gameplay and visuals. The Japanese gaming magazine Famitsu said, it appears like the other Mario games, and the Electronic Gaming Monthly said Super Mario World may not look as good as Nintendo's other planned games, but that won't stop Takashi Tezuka, Shigeru Miyamoto, and the rest of the Super Mario World team. The magazine Monthly, which gets exclusive information on Japanese video games, said as much. The Super Famicom's release delay ended up being a good thing. It's easy to see how, with an extra year of development time, Super Mario World could have been the definitive platforming experience. The development team for Super Mario World benefited from the extra year given to them thanks to the Super Famicom's release being pushed back to the fall of 1990. There was a window of opportunity for Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka 
to adjust the game's difficulty and polish its overall feel. How can the team behind Super Mario make it such that players of all skill levels may enjoy it? Furthermore, how might they provide these players greater leeway to implement their own strategies? The group typically worked late into the night brainstorming, but one suggestion uncovered a treasure trove of opportunities. In my opinion, the best video games are a lot like our all-time favorite playgrounds. They're the kind of places we come to love and want to visit again and again. What a fantastic idea, Shigeru Miyamoto, to have a drawer full of different playgrounds at your disposal. The world map became Miyamoto and Tezuka's plaything. The first Super Mario game to have a globe map was 1993's Super Mario Bros. 3, developed by Nintendo. Players may pick and choose the paths they wish to take through the game. Nonetheless, the journey to Bowser and back to rescue the princess was rather straightforward. The idea was originally brought over to Super Mario World, but aside from cosmetic changes, it was otherwise the same as in the original game. Player's advancement was indicated by a number on the main menu. However, the world map was modified in ways unrelated to levels and secrets. They helped keep things even as well. The producers of several games have included an easy mode and hard mode on the game's main menu so that players can select their preferred level of challenge. Miyamoto, however, did not approve of this design decision and rather that players be able to alter the game's complexity on the fly. To solve this problem, Toshihiko Nakago, the director of programming, suggested using dotted line blocks. The concept originated from some mental arithmetic. The group decided to experiment with different kinds of blocks in difficulty settings. It grew from there into something much larger. The dotted lines players encountered throughout the stages were all different colors. In order to make the blocks work, the player had to locate the corresponding switch palace on the map. This new platform or power-up made it so that Mario could complete the level more quickly. Players might choose to ignore the switch palaces in order to increase the difficulty of the game. Once again, the landscape of Dinosaur Land looked like a chessboard. The Forest of Illusion, Twin Bridges, and Star World were just three of the nine distinct regions available for exploration. Donut Plains, Vanilla Dome, and Chocolate Island are just a few of the many places in this world named after tasty treats. With a fresh world map and exciting new areas for Mario to discover, character designer Shigefumi Hino saw a perfect chance to modernize the game's graphics. Goombas, Lakitus, and Dry Bones are just a few of the traditional opponents that were given makeovers. The Koopa Troopas evolved quite a bit. In the past, Koopa Troopas would move as slowly as turtles as they traversed each level. Koopa Troopas have now begun to walk on all fours. Mario might use his bouncing skills to coax them out of their shells, exposing a helpless baby lizard stripped down to its underpants. Some of them would even try to get back in their shells or kick them at Mario. Both Hino and Tezuka created new antagonists to go alongside the series' canon villains. There was the temperamental caterpillar Wiggler, the football-playing Koopa Charge and Chuck who needed three hits to bring down, and the drowsy fish Rip Van Fish who eagerly chased Mario when he woke up. And what good would a dinosaur-free dinosaur land be anyway? Two stomps were needed to bring down Rex. The Dino Rhino was a massive, nearsighted foe who, when stepped upon, transformed into a torch. There was Resnor, the fire-breathing Triceratops that watched over multiple castles. And there was Blarg, the enormous dinosaur who waited for Mario to pass by beneath the lava. On the other hand, not every dinosaur was hostile. Even just one new friend would alter the Super Mario franchise significantly. Shigeru Miyamoto had, for the past five years, kept a sketch of Mario penning a dinosaur on his desk. He had been eager to incorporate it ever since he played the original Super Mario Bros. game. Team members really wanted to include it in Super Mario Bros. 3, but technical constraints prevented it. The Super Famicom, however, was a 16-bit console with a lot of potential. Tezuka saw the sketch again and thought he would try drawing it. 
He pitched the concept to Shigefu Mihino, the game's character designer, who drew a dinosaur Mario could mount and ride like a horse. The first form of Hino's concept resembled a crocodile. When asked for advice, Tezuka offered a few recommendations. To better fit in with the Koopa Troopas, the dinosaur should be scaled down, made cute, and given a close connection to them. The final design for the figure, a green dinosaur with a shell on its back that doubled as a saddle, emerged gradually as a result of these alterations made by Hino. Tezuka thought he became a very endearing persona. Initially, they were just using Mia Yoshimura's nickname Yoshi for the character, but eventually that name stuck. Yoshi provided more than simply transportation, making level exploration more enjoyable. Yoshi could be used to eat adversaries or collect far-off objects to let Mario jump higher to get around obstacles. It's possible that Yoshi won't get special abilities as well. Yoshi, for instance, may use the various colored Koopa shells to perform actions like breathing fire, temporarily gaining flight, or stopping the ground. Moreover, he could gain extra lives, upgrades, and currency by eating berries that were strategically placed throughout each level. Additionally, Yoshi gave Mario a free blow. When Mario was attacked, Yoshi would flee, but the player might catch up with him afterward. Yoshi served as Mario's new, powerful power-up on his adventure. The development team also reintroduced certain previously removed abilities. The standard items were present, such as a super mushroom to increase Mario's size, a fire flower to launch fireballs, and a superstar to temporarily make Mario invincible. The super leaf, which temporarily granted Mario the ability to fly by transforming him into a raccoon, was brought back by the development team. However, they believed that they could improve in light of all the other shifts taking place. Players can maintain greater control while in flight and increase their time in the air by rocking back and forth. Mario has also the ability to dive bomb foes from above. You've never seen a power-up this complex before in the series. The developers were always making little adjustments to the cape's functionality. Many of the test players gave up because it was too difficult, and Mario's new spin jump was made possible by the additional buttons on the Super Famicom controller. A button click caused Mario to stomp on opponents, bounce over barriers, or destroy bricks from above. Super Mario World was largely finished by the summer of 1990, two years after development had begun. Tezuka and his team believed they had perfected the ideas of independence, physical prowess, and kindness that made the series stand out. Even with all the new visuals and sound, Nintendo managed to fit the entire game onto a 4-megabit cartridge, which was no small feat. Nintendo included the subtitle Super Mario Bros. 4 on the box to remind fans that it was the fourth installment in the long-running Famicom series. The original Super Mario World was the perfect example of a launch game. It was a great way to demonstrate the hardware's cutting-edge features while also reassuring players who were already familiar with the series. It represented the Super Famicom in many respects, the controller's basic color scheme, the game was filled with bright splashes of color, from the box cover to the Yoshis and Koopa shells. Even though Shigefu Mihino was apprehensive about getting development started, in the end, he was convinced that they had created a masterpiece in their chosen field. A year after announcing the delay of the system, Nintendo had been rather quiet until June 21, 1990, when they finally provided an update. On November 21, 1990, the Super Famicom was scheduled for release. During the 28th and 29th of August, Nintendo hosted a Shoshinkai convention in Tokyo's Harumi International Exhibition Center. At last count, there were 33 studios working on Super Famicom titles. Companies from all around were present to show off their forthcoming games, but the spotlight was squarely on Nintendo they unveiled the final Super Famicom console for the first time. The system's asking price was 25,000 yen, which is equivalent to around $170.
Nintendo intentionally left off the necessary cables and AC adapters to keep the price low. Two new games from Nintendo were also shown off for the first time. For starters, there was the lightning-fast arcade racer F-Zero. It featured Mode 7, a new technology for the Super Famicom that simulated 3D. After Donkey Kong, Super Mario World followed next. So that is all the time we had today, folks. Hope you enjoyed this video. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel and do hit the bell icon on your way out.